The evil Emperor Palpatine may be back for the Rise of Skywalker, but there's still a lot we don't know about this mysterious Dark Lord of the Sith. Here are a few of the commonly held misconceptions about the Emperor and his origins. When you think of Emperor Palpatine, you probably think of Scottish actor Ian McDermott. After all, McDermott has played the Emperor for almost all of his major appearances. He's the man behind the makeup during Palpatine's first major appearance in Return of the Jedi. He plays the conniving Chancellor in all three of George Lucas's prequels. He provided Palpatine's voice for the Emperor's cameos in Star Wars Rebels, and he's coming back to play the mysteriously resurrected despot in The Rise of Skywalker, too. But McDermott wasn't actually the first person to portray Palpatine on screen. For the Emperor's first brief appearance in The Empire Strikes Back, Palpatine was originally brought to life by one man, two women, and a wild animal. Actress Marjorie Eaton provided the Emperor's face for the final movie, while makeup artist Rick Baker tested Eaton's prosthetics on his wife, Elaine. Clive Ravel, an accomplished actor and a friend of Empire director Irvin Kirshner, provided his voice. Palpatine's eerie yellow eyes, meanwhile, weren't human at all. They belonged to a chimp and were superimposed over Eaton's during post-production. George Lucas replaced the eaton revel ape hybrid with new footage featuring McDermott for the 2004 DVD release of The Empire Strikes Back. But a few other actors took on the role of Palpatine after that, too. In the early sessions of the Clone Wars animated series, actor Ian Abercrombie voiced Palpatine. After Abercrombie passed away, the role was taken over by Tim Curry, who you might best known as being the guy who did this. I see you shiver with anticipation. The Emperor has always been part of the Star Wars story. After all, it's kind of hard to have an empire without one. But the Emperor wasn't always Palpatine, and he wasn't always the series' main villain either. In George Lucas's earliest first draft of Star Wars, the Emperor was a man named Kaz Dashit, who is described in the script as being a thin, gray-looking man with an evil mustache which hangs limply over his insipid lip. Dashit wasn't Force-sensitive. He wasn't that scary, either, and Darth Vader spent a good deal of the movie plotting to undermine his authority. By the time the final movie rolled around, the Emperor was known as Palpatine but he still wasn't the Palpatine that you know today. In Alan Dean Foster's official Star Wars novelization, Palpatine is depicted as a recluse who disappeared from public view long ago, and who was quickly manipulated and controlled by his own Imperial underlings. Like all the other Star Wars film novelizations, Foster's book was considered in continuity right up until the point other canon materials explicitly contradicted it. That means that, until The Empire Strikes Back was released, Emperor Palpatine wasn't really the villain of the story. Instead, the Imperial governors and bureaucrats who used the Emperor for their own ambitions were the real villains. That includes figures like Grand Moff Tarkin, who oversaw the Death Star's construction, and Darth Vader himself. Compared to them, Palpatine was just an afterthought. In the original Star Wars trilogy, the chief villain was just known as the Emperor. Later, however, supplementary materials such as novels, role-playing games, and screenplays showed that his last name was Palpatine. The prequel trilogy went further still and revealed that he was from the planet Naboo and that he's known among the Sith as Darth Sidious. But so far, Emperor Palpatine's first name has yet to be spoken on screen. That doesn't mean he doesn't have one, of course. It just took a long, long time for fans to learn it. In 2014, several decades after the Emperor's big screen debut, Delray Books published Tarkin, one of the very first novels in the new Disney-approved Star Wars canon. While the book's plot centers on the rise of Willif Tarkin, a former Clone Wars soldier who rose through the Imperial ranks to become the Empire's very first Grand Moff, it does contain one crucial piece of trivia for Palpatine fans. The former Chancellor's first name is Sheev. Okay, yes, that sounds kind of silly, but most of Naboo's citizens have names that appear to be derived from Sanskrit, so Sheev fits, and with good reason. George Lucas himself came up with it. As Tarkin author James Lucino explains, Lucas shared the name while working on Underworld, Lucasfilm's ill-fated attempt at a live-action Star Wars television show. Lucasfilm's story group gave the name to Lucino, and he put it in Tarkin. Given how Palpatine looks, you might think that he's pretty ancient. 
especially since his master was Darth Plagueis the Wise. You know, the Sith who mastered the secret of eternal life. But apparently, that's not the case at all. According to the company's old official timeline, Palpatine was born a mere 82 years before the first Death Star was destroyed in the Battle of Yavin, making him only 86 when Darth Vader killed him. Much of the information from when that timeline was published is no longer canon, but allusions in Disney-approved material such as the novel Tarkin imply that Palpatine's age hasn't changed much, if at all, in this brand new era. So, ugly, yes. Old, not so much. As it turns out, that was very good news for Ian McDermott. McDermott was only 37 when he played Palpatine in Return of the Jedi, but his age didn't matter then because he was wearing makeup. By the time The Phantom Menace rolled around, during which Palpatine is supposed to look pretty normal, McDermott and his villainous alter ego were about the same age. Revenge of the Sith goes out of its way to explain why Palpatine appears as a normal middle-aged man in the prequels but looks like a monster in the original Star Wars trilogy. During Palpatine's fight with Mace Windu, the Jedi Master uses his lightsaber to reflect Palpatine's Force lightning back on him. When the lightning hits Palpatine's face, he transforms into the Emperor everyone knows and hates. Problem solved, right? Except that's not how Force lightning works. Luke wasn't scarred when the Emperor hit him with Force Lightning in Return of the Jedi. Neither was Anakin when Count Dooku zapped him in Attack of the Clones, or Kylo Ren when he was hit by Supreme Leader Snoke. In the Star Wars Insider issue 82, Ian McDermott explains that Palpatine's evil visage is actually what he always looked like and that his more human appearance was just a facade. With Palpatine dropping his pretenses and revealing himself as a Sith Lord, he decides that there's no reason to hide his true face either. That's not the gospel, though. Matt Martin, a member of Lucasfilm's story group, has his own theory. Palpatine was exerting so much power to deflect the lightning that the dark side itself warped his looks. Various reference books have similar explanations, but there's no clear canonical explanation for the discrepancy. Most masters teach their apprentices, obviously, right? That's literally the point of having an apprentice in the first place, but not Palpatine. Although Darth Sidious might have offered training to Darth Maul and Darth Vader with Count Dooku, he took a bit of a shortcut. See, unlike Maul or Anakin, Dooku was already a full-fledged Jedi when Palpatine got his hooks in him. During a scene deleted from Attack of the Clones, it is revealed that Dooku had renounced his Jedi vows in favor of returning to the wealth and power afforded to him by his heritage. I never understood why he quit. Well, one might say he was always a bit out of step with the decisions of the Council. Rumors suggested that Dooku was actually planning to found his own Jedi Order, but fate had other plans. When Darth Maul died at Obi-Wan Kenobi's hands, Palpatine needed a replacement and he needed one fast. Dooku, who had already mastered the Force and proved that he was sympathetic to the dark side, was right there for the taking. The complete story has yet to be revealed, but Palpatine recruited Dooku, named him Darth Tyrannus, and nabbed himself a ready-made henchman without any fuss. If only it were always that easy. Disney and Lucasfilm have been open and frank about the fact that their sequel trilogy wasn't planned out in advance. A couple of weeks before The Force Awakens premiered, Lucasfilm president Kathleen Kennedy told Variety that they hadn't mapped out every single detail of the next two films. While Ryan Johnson wasn't given much direction as to where to take The Last Jedi's plot during the writing process. All in all, it appears that Disney and Lucasfilm have been making it all up as they go along. Palpatine seems to be the one big exception. While it'd be easy to dismiss the Emperor's upcoming appearance in The Rise of Skywalker as a last-minute ploy to shock audiences, it's apparently been in the works for a while. At Star Wars Celebration 2019 in Chicago, Kathleen Kennedy told Yahoo that Palpatine's return had been in the works for a long time. She explained, We had not landed on exactly how we might do that, but it was always going to be part of Episode 9. That's all well and good, but that's also not exactly how it went down. Original Star Wars Episode IX director Colin Trevorrow revealed that his version did not feature the Emperor at all. Bringing back the Emperor was an idea JJ brought to the table when he came on board. It's honestly something I never considered. I commend him for it. This was a tough story to unlock, and he found the key. The moral of the story is Palpatine is back, whether you wanted him or not, and the universe is a lot less safer with him around. 
Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about Star Wars are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.